Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are part of the organizing committee of the next European Neuroscience Conference by doctoral students. The ENCODES conference will be celebrated in Paris next July 7th and 8th. If you want to join us in this event, registration is currently open until January the 30th. The reason for today's interview is so, so you can know more about one of our keynote speakers. So today we are pleased to have with us Dr. Giorgi Busacchi. Giorgi Busacchi is the big professor of neuroscience at New York University School of Medicine. He's also a member of the National Academy Society of Sciences USA, Academia Europe, and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Busacchi's primary interest is neuronal syntax, how segmentation of neuronal information is organized by the numerous brain rhythms to support cognitive function with a primary interest in brain oscillation, sleep, and memory. Welcome, Dr. Busaki, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So I will start with the first questions. The neuroscience research evolved a lot during the past days, years, and this is thanks to the new technologies that we have, but also thanks to a change in the way of thinking about neuroscience. And you are one of the first who challenged the way of looking at the brain and its different structures and functions. If we are not mistaken, you initiated your graduate studies in the 70s. Looking back at your early days in research, what was your impression of the field of neuroscience? And do you remember what was it that proper your interest in studying neuronal populations? Well, first of all, there was no such term as neuroscience in the 1970s. <laughs> I was a medical student in Hungary, influenced largely by the Pavlovian doctrine. Many of us recognized the shortcomings of the theory of stimulus substitution and regarding the brain as a passive associational device. You may remember that CSU as conditioning, when, when you condition an animal, there's no need for behavior. The only thing is needed is the animal passively associate the CSNUS and response to food. The potential problem, of course, was there that, that there was no good theory behind that. The idea was of stimulus substitution that there was a representation in the brain that represented food. A potential antidote to this, I would say, British empiricism Pavlovian theory was the new science of ethology, you know, after Conrad Lorenz, Frisch and Tim Bergen received the Nobel Prize for studying behavior. So obviously as a young person, you follow the bandwagon <laughs> and I became a neuroethologist. I studied the detailed behavior of cats and mice, creating ethograms of everything I could observe from ear pricks to vocalization and so on. So back then, one of the greatest deb debates was whether the conditional stimulus is regarded by the animal as, as I said, representation or substitute of the reward, as both Pavlov and everybody else thought, or alternatively, the CS serves as a new goal for the animal that predicts that something is useful, therefore it is worthwhile investigating. I discovered great thinkers such as Piotr Krupalov, whom I call the Russian Tolman. And his, I, I've translated his works from Russian to English. That was probably my earliest contribution to neuroscience. And learned about a new field known as auto-shaping. None of you know what I'm talking about. But this term refers to the fact that the experimenter doesn't have to shape the animal's behavior. It is sufficient to expose the animal to a CSUS contingency and the animal just cannot help. It inevitably will respond behaviorally to the CS. That is, it shapes its own behavior, whether required by the experiment or not. Some of you may remember Skinner's influential book, which was titled The Behavior of Organism. It's a mandatory reading for you guys. <laughs> uh, it was a Bible in the 1960s. But then, interestingly, his students, a wife, and husband duo, the Brallans, they became circus trainers and worked with thousands of animals and wrote a paper with a provocative title, 
which is the misbehavior of organism. Because they realized that, that they observed over and over that different species act very differently in the same situation that is set up by the experimenter. And their behavior is largely guided by their species specific inherited behavior or repertoire. Now, returning to my problem that you asked about, the issue to be solved was whether the animal displays towards the CS is a consumatory behavior or a preparatory behavior. Is it a, driven by curiosity and it's a, it's a new goal or it's simply a representation? So many great labs came up with all sorts of fantastic designs and typically found what they expected to find and offered support for either consumatory or preparatory interpretations. You know, this problem is probably familiar to you. <laughs> the way you set up your experiments biases how you, what kind of answers you get. So the field has come to a halt because behavioral observations alone could not provide the necessary ground truth. So I thought that the best way to move forward is to ask the brain. My mentor, Andrew Groschan, has already showed that hippocampal theta oscillations correlated with orienting behavior or orienting response, which is a preparatory action. Thus, we thought that all you need is to put an electrode in the brain, monitor the electrical activity during CS orienting behavior, that is when the animal is dealing with the CS, and, and you get the answer immediately. Indeed, we observed that theta oscillations were present. Therefore, CS directed action could not be the representation of reward because that should be a consumatory behavior associated with non theta. In other words, recording from the brain gave a direct answer to a debate that no amount of cleverly designed behavior, behavioral experiments could answer. Thus, this early work to me completely reset my thinking and led me to study the brain as brain activity guiding the behavior rather than the other way around. If I may ask um, out of curiosity, at that time, like at the end of the 70s, um, I remember that the article from Terje Lomo about long-term potentiation was like released or and published, but you were very young and like starting in research, like at some point did you consider following that path since you were, since you were studying the hippocampus? So the field was small, much smaller than today. When I came to the United States, I was introduced by Rob Isaacson, Bob Isaacson as this is a guy from behind the Iron Curtain who has read every single paper about the hippocampus. And it was almost true. Today, it's totally impossible. So of course we knew about Terry Lomo and Tim Bliss's experiment. We knew about everything, not necessarily immediately, but in a few months later on. But do, did we know about each other's work, everything? No, it is worth studying how ideas emerged. You know, the, we write the history backwards and we write the history with our current logic. So there are many papers published, the reviews published in Science and Nature about LTP learning and so on. And it is usually introduced that, oh, there was this great theory about plasticity. There was a great theory about this and there was an experiment needed and this is what was done by LTP. No, <laughs> it was discovered in a totally independent way. And it became later a useful thing. So I followed the literature, you know, it's this kind of trivial that some synaptic plasticity is present in the brain. You don't really have to invent anything. And that was this too. So many years later, when I, when we looked at, at well, discovered what we call sharp wave ripples, then there was this very powerful burst with about 200 Hertz. And I said, why is it, what is it good for? You go back to the literature and you see that, oh, the best way to produce long-term potentiation is 200 hertz. So immediately, you know, I jumped onto the conclusion, perhaps prematurely, that uh, this is a pattern that is capable of do, doing in vivo what people were searching for in vitro. So these were the kind of interactions. And of course, you organized a meeting, which I did as a young person. I invited everybody in the field who did LTP. And you are trying to convince your own crazy ideas, and they try to do the same thing. 
and then uh, they go home and then uh, they do experiments and so on. This is not very different today, except that you have usually 10 minutes for discussion and there are many people in the audience and uh, you, you don't have that long interaction. Just to give you an example, in the 1960s, 70s, there were meetings that lasted for two days, the presentations. But some talks were followed by a debate for one and a half days. And all of this is documented. All of this is documented in, in the publications that came after the meetings, because there were not meetings every week. There were, there were rare, meetings very rarely, but these were all documented. That is documented in a, in, a, in a book series called the Macy Foundations that was sponsoring all of these things. I'm not saying this is good. It would be probably impossible today, but if you would like to trace the maturation of thinking in neuroscience, most of these ideas are beautifully documented. Wow. Oh, thank you so much for interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I have another question. Um, you've been studying the hippocampus for, for so many years now. Would you say that um, based on the information that we have today, all the information that we store in our memory is encoded in neur neural networks, or would you consider the possibility that there is maybe another dimension, maybe at the quantum level, um, where we might be storing information? Whoa, this is a uh, very charged question. <laughs> Let me try the way to explain the way I, I'm thinking about. First of all, explanations at each level can have their own necessary and perhaps sufficient granularity. There is no need to explain the knee-jerk reflex with quantum mechanics. You can, I can explain the knee-jerk reflex to my neighbor with simple terms without resorting to molecular biology or quantum mechanics. It would just confuse you if, uh, rather than help anybody if you go far away from the level that you are trying to, un to understand or explain. Memory is a very tricky thing because we still do not have a good definition. When we mentally travel back in, in the past or into the past, we call it post-diction. But when we imagine the future, we call it prediction. And you know, are these processes separate? Is there a separate mechanism for memory and imagination and, and planning? Can you or anybody make predictions without a battery of postdictions or memories? Well, it seems that this, these two are intertwined. And indeed, when you look at the uh, fMRI responses in the human brain, when you ask the person to plan ahead or imagine something, it's the same areas that light up that usually are traditionally involved in memory. And this is true in, in our work also in physiology. Now, Let's just go back a little bit. So 100 years ago, which is not so long ago, right? People made distinction between true and artificial memories. True memories were given to humans by God, while artificial memories were acquired here on earth. Today, we simply refer to artificial memory as memory and forget a bit, bit about the phylogenetically inherited stuff. Now, remember the misbehavior manifesto that I just mentioned, written by the Brellas, that, that you, you, would, you were asking is that what are, what, we are not really investigating the relationship between phy phylogenetically biased and acquired memories, but we just take it for granted that the brain is a tabula rasa, we acquire everything. But if they are separate somewhat, we would like to know whether this inherited memory has a different mechanism from the acquired memory at different neuronal substrates also. Now you ask about where they are, whether they are in quanta or in a, in a cloud or somewhere. Well, today, a group of prominent and outstanding investigators believe in the agram, that there is a physical thing that could be grabbed onto. The engram is basically a movie metaphor that is once the data are engraved or written in 
the brain, they are frozen and immutable. Memory in this framework is a very close snapshot of the representation of space-time uh, where events occur. If our memories are isomorphic with the engram, then indeed we can regard them as things that can be made, replaced, repaired, exchanged, cloned, or even stored for an eternity in some immortalized format and recreate you, or at least your mind in silico. <laughs> and that, that, you know, this is something you might think about. These experiments may seduce you that and believe that specific movie-like memories can be created, incepted, modified, or abolished at will. That's a great idea. The problem is that the movie metaphor is very misleading. A movie, once created, does not interact with anything or anywhere else anymore, and it exists in isolation. It can be replayed many, many times without altering its content. You have seen a movie, 20 years ago, you see this movie today, it's exactly the same movie. In contrast, when experiences are relived during the process of recall, they inevitably interact with other memories and with the rest of the brain in its new state. And the old memories can be mixed with experiences acquired between the last and current recall of the episode. The process of recall is in fact a reinterpretation of the retrieved neural patterns but in a different state. After successful record, now memories are returned back to storage and carry the new and somewhat modified context with them. In short, memories undergo what we call perpetual modification or restabilization. Potentially, this may occur even without conscious record, such as when you fall asleep tonight. This is called replay events. Now, this is a long answer to your very simple question, but it hopefully illuminates how answers and our answers and scientific strategies are influenced and guided by our mental frameworks. Incidentally, these issues about memory were debated with the same vigor in the 1970s as they are today. Just Google the term scotophobin. Remember, scotophobin and you will discover a fascinating and long forgotten literature about the same exact problems that we are discussing today. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. So I will go with the next one. Um, every year, anchors is a general theme. And this year we choose working across scales in neuroscience. And with this theme, we hope to bring awareness about how neuroscientists usually integrate more than one special, spatial or temporal scale. And in your case, you constantly move between the cellular level and network levels. Is there another scale in terms of space and time that you wish to integrate in your research? Well, this is a great topic. Uh, I think it was very well chosen because uh, this issue of scaling comes back over and over, no matter where you are, whether you are dealing with physics whether you are dealing with molecular biology, neurons, cells, or the topics of, uh, of neuroscience. Well, one of the most fascinating problems for me is, is scaling and its rules. Namely, how do you scale up a brain from a tiny tissue to 15,000 fold to become the brain of a whale? So scaling is a rule where you do some manipulations, but you preserve the essentials of the system. Now, what is to be preserved in the brain? I assume that some of the essential features which are necessary for fundamental brain operations are the ones. One thing that it's, to me, it seems to be preserved is timing. This is the confidence for timing in me is that brain oscillations in the tissue and in the, in the large brain, such as your brain and my brain, are pretty much the same from ultra slow to very fast ripple oscillations. It seems that wiring and many properties of neurons and circuit must be enslaved to preserve this important thing, the timing requirements. Perhaps it is a, a good thing, 
since most animals live in the same physical world, as well as the same have the same kind of effectors, which are our muscles, and myosin has the same speed in every species. So, of course, an interesting issue about scales is that they vary in orders of magnitude. That's why it is so interesting because they, there is enormous diversity. In my previous book called Rhythm of the Brain, I have discussed power laws and their relationship to brain dynamic quite a bit. Since then, research in our laboratories and labs in our, several other laboratories have shown that brain connectivity from the microscopic to the macroscopic level can be described by a log normal formula, which is a logarithmic scale. This logarithmic based substrate is then combined with neurons whose dynamic interactions from synaptic weights to and firing rates also obey a log normal statistics. In turn, when you combine the anatomy with dynamics, it gives rise to a log normal population event. So the fraction of neurons that are firing in our brains at the moment, at least in the, let's say the hippocampus in a single theta cycle, is about 0.01%, which is a very small fraction. But occasionally, two orders of magnitude more neurons fire together. And this shows a very nice skewed and log normal distribution. Now, related to this physiological argument, if we are trying to understand memories that span from seconds to hours, months, and years, we tend to postulate that there must be different mechanisms because one is so long, the other one is so short. On the other hand, if you view these time scales against a log ruler, then minutes and years are only a few log units apart. So this is interesting because you may know that the most famous law in neuroscience, there are not too many laws in biology, but at least in neuroscience, but the most famous law that we all know is the Weber law or Weber Fechner law of our perceptions, which is a logarithmic rule. And I believe that the, this perceptual law is supported by the log rules that penetrate everything at every scale of neural organization from synaptic waves to system levels interaction. Now, going back to your question, uh, my short answer is that perhaps thinking about scales in neuroscience from this perspective, from the log perspective, may help a little bit. Thank you. So we're gonna to go to more lighter question now. So um, is there a particular finding driving from your research or from the neuroscience field in general that was particularly surprising for you? Like a discovery, for example, that marked you? Um, every piece of research is surprising to me. <laughs> this is why we publish them. If your findings don't surprise anybody, why would you publish it, right? And for me, the most fascinating thing is always the last thing that we found. You know, I, I don't want to single out, said, oh, I had an aha moment when I woke up at, uh, at your age or sometime and I said, okay, this was the most important thing in life. The research okay. or your research is not determined by you. It's determined by history and it's a judgment of others. You know, Johannes Kepler didn't have the four Kepler laws. It was uh, Isaac Newton who said, oh, this guy discovered four laws <laughs> and so on and so on. So it, you, you always miscalibrate yourself. Said, oh, no, my most important contribution to this would be this, but people judge you differently. Okay, that's good, even as a general advice. Um, and in six months, the ENCODE conference will take place and we expect around 100 attendees. They are all young students. So is there any message you would like to send them now as a starting pass, maybe a piece of advice? Uh, who am I to give you an advice? <laughs> well, if I can say something that I would say, don't follow the bandwagon. Okay. <laughs> so there are popular themes always. Today it could be you know, reinforcement learning and decision making and things like that. Yeah. But they may become obsolete overnight. I think it is much more fun to Pick an area that you are really interested in, be it meditation 
or reformulation of mental diseases or whatever, and try to meet, make a difference with your work in that particular field. I guarantee you that if you find something interesting, others will follow you. Mm. The only sobering warning is that to make sure that your fantasies are translatable to interpretable experiments. If something is not solvable, it cannot be an exciting topic in neuroscience. Other than that, anything, you know, neuroscience is like the wild west. One person can find as much gold as a very well-organized large group. There are no rules yet and probably won't be for a while. Okay, thank you. So we were really happy to have you today. Uh, thank you for your time and your responses. If you uh, want to know more about uh, Dr. Buzaki's work, you can find um, his paper and uh, research at buzakilab.com. And you can also enjoy his last book, The Brain from Inside Out. We are looking all um, forward to see you in person in the City of Love, Paris. So bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys.